I'll take this one. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know you're as excited as I am that we're, uh, uh, we've had uh, uh, one of America's uh, most eminent and interesting journalists on campus really all afternoon. He's been gracious enough to visit with uh, two classes and a lot of our faculty. And so uh, at the risk of wearing him out, uh, uh, we, have, we have presumed on a lot of his time. Um, uh, as you think about your questions tonight, you've got a lot of choices. Uh, when I think about the people who have joined us for evenings like this, uh, there hasn't been anyone as, uh, let's say, eclectic as uh, tonight's guest. And so you've got a, uh, a wide range of topics on which uh, he's interesting to hear from. So I'll ask, as usual, we've given uh, our, our guest the option of, of uh, orating uh, for a while, but he's uh, said that <laughs> he said that he uh, would uh, be just as comfortable to uh, do this in a, in a question and answer style. So by your leave, I'll ask a few while you compose your own thoughts. But as soon as I see uh, uh, a little line at the mics, we'll, uh, we'll turn the evening, the rest of the hour over to you. So please uh, show your appreciation for the effort he's already put in and welcome Frank Bruni of the New York Times. So among the uh, uh, countless uh, subjects, Frank, that you have covered, uh, football is even in there. And I noticed as the uh, NFL... I shouldn't say it, but I'm a big Denver Broncos fan. I know that's yeah. not good. <laughs> and Cole, but you beat us last year in the yeah. playoffs, yeah, yeah, so yeah. we're, you know. It's permissible. Don't forget where Peyton Manning went. We, yeah. He's got some... <laughs> so, uh, true. we got some second-order Denver fans, and I'm one. Um, but uh, I just noticed as they went through this exercise of cutting down the rosters, there's, I saw some commentary about a, a multi-position player seem to be in vogue these days. A lot of them stuck. And you're a multi-position player. If I've ever seen, I'm going to miss some, but you have written uh, books and certainly columns on uh, politics, uh, religion, uh, sports I mentioned. You've been a war correspondent. Uh, you have uh, 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 been a uh, movie critic. And uh, intriguingly, you have been uh, a restaurant critic. Um, how does a career like that happen? Is it, this is sort of a nature or nurture question. Did, were you just determined to not be uh, tied to one subject, or did uh, 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 entities you worked for uh, just uh, move you around and take advantage of your versatility? I, a little bit of both. I mean, my younger brother always teases me about this. He says, I don't have a career. I have an attention deficit disorder, <laughs> which is... Um, which is true. Um, no, I've been very lucky. Early on, when I got into journalism, I sort of decided, and I don't know what led me to do it or to have that kind of prescience, but I thought the, uh, the best thing you can do with the passport that journalism gives you um, is, is travel with it anywhere that your bosses will let you. I mean, I mean that metaphorically. And so I just resolved early on that I wanted to use um, the the opportunity of being a journalist to experience as many different things as I could. And I would just keep you know, pushing at the doors. And, and uh, if my employers thought I was suitable for that and would let me do it. Um, and that's the way it worked out. And I remember um, it, I, I worked at the Detroit Free Press before the New York Times. Um, that was where I wrote about religion and AIDS and gay issues and was a movie critic for my last couple of years there. Um, and when I got to the Times, I remember someone saying to me, we don't hire people for jobs. We hire them for careers. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's a really pretty line that they probably roll out on everyone. <laughs> um, but it, it turned out to be true. They, uh, at, every, at every turn, they, they gave me the opportunity to do different things, to do more things. Um, and since it's my nature to rove like that, I just always said yes. And in the column now, it appears you have a roving portfolio. Right. They, oh, they, uh, when just, they gave me the column, they yeah. said, now you can sort of, in in the span of one month, be as diverse as you've been over the last yeah. 15 years. Well, you're fun to follow, because no two in a, no two in consecutive uh, columns are on the same topic, it seems. And I hope so. Uh, it's yeah. interesting. Um, you've written m several books, but the recent one, uh, of course, caught the eye of a lot of people here. It's an, uh, a, a topic uh, uh, both uh, generally and specifically of interest here at Purdue University, given the uh, our nature as a land-grant school is a public university. And I'm guessing and I'm hoping that a uh, large uh, number of 
attendees tonight have read it. Those who haven't are going to want to. Uh, where you go is not who you'll be. And um, you have uh, had a hard look and a critical look at the way um, the co uh, parents and students choose colleges, the way colleges uh, 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 inveigle them to choose. Uh, and uh, you've, you've cautioned about some things not to look for. Right. Uh, elite uh, reputations, rankings, high sticker prices. Uh, what should today's uh, uh, students be looking for? I think um, I think college, if it's within your economic grasp, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to start out there because um, I wish more kids had the ability to choose college without worrying about the dollars and cents and whether that's all going to work out. But if you do have some economic freedom, agency, wiggle room, um, I think. The best way to choose college and the way I see far too people choosing college is to think about um, how you're going to complete and grow yourself. Um, I see far too many uh, kids automatically going to a school close to home, automatically going to a school because um, all of his or her peers have gone there, um, and it offers that sense of the familiar and the sense of continuity. Um, and I think college should be more disruptive. Um, one of the things, I, one of the reasons I'm a big fan of universities like Purdue um, is you have a scale here um, and an automatic socioeconomic diversity here um, that no matter where you're coming from to come here, if you want to use a school like this to become more fluent in diversity, um, to explore crannies and byways of your intellectual life or your social life that you haven't before, you can do it because it's all here. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's what I really think people, I mean, kids and their parents need to have conversations about what of the world do I already know? And am I going to a college that's going to show me facets and sides of the world that I don't know? Because if college isn't going to make me a bigger person, why am I going in the first place? Mm -hmm. You used a, a, a phrase that I thought was terrific, but I want to make sure I understand it. And, and uh, again, that you get a chance to I share it. I used it a while ago. I may not understand it myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, on the off chance that you do, you said that you thought a lot of students and uh, their parents uh, suffered from a failure of boldness. And I thought that was kind of an eye-catching phrase, but just to make sure that I uh, captured its meaning, what, what, what did you have in mind? Well, I think they take the path of least resistance. Um, they go with the familiar. Mm -hmm. um, they follow their friends to a school that, um, in too many instances, is just an upsizing of the high school they came from. They've really just, they've enlarged the stage without diversifying it at all. Um, and then they get there, um, and again, they kind of think, how do I get through this, um, this most smoothly? Um, how do I get through it without incident? Um, how do I get through it without any danger of a bad grade? Um, and there's so much of life ahead where the price of mistakes gets a lot higher. And it's hard to see this when you're in college, but the price of mistakes at that stage of the game, the price is pretty low. If you're going to make mistakes, if you're going to go down dead ends, do it between the ages of 19 and 23. Mm -hmm. Do it in college. Um, but that requires some boldness. That requires some courage, um, to use a, a word our president likes, some audacity. Um, and and I, I feel too frequently people elect um, safety. Um, they elect something that's going to be assured. They follow a script that's been laid out for them rather than inventing one themselves. Um, and I really wish they wouldn't, because I don't think you ever truly discover um, what you're capable of and your strengths unless you wander off script and unless, unless you wander down tributaries um, that maybe don't look so welcoming at the start. You also had some uh, uh, stunning depictions of, uh, of, uh, of another, uh, uh, I would say, a set of, of um, uh, students and their parents. And these are the folks attend, uh, who sh uh, shipping, um, you know, young Frank at the age of three to a $30,000 preschool, which is supposed to prepare him for a $60,000 K-6, which is supposed to prepare him eventually for For it will probably be an $80,000 university yeah. experience by the yeah. time they get there. Uh, yeah. Some of those uh, 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 stories and people you uh, r reported on were uh, almost caricatures, but it's a real phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon. I mean, I see it because I'm in Manhattan, which yeah. is one of the places. But um, when I went around the country talking about the book, it was funny how many places thought they were ground zero for this. So, you know, I would go to um, uh, the, the suburbs of Chicago, um, and people would say, well, you, now 
you're in the belly of the beast. This is where parents really go crazy. <laughs> and then I would go to Palo Alto and they would say, you've never seen anything like Palo Alto. You know, Everybody was convinced that it was the most obsessive, most hyped up, all that sort of stuff. Um, but in, in a certain kind of climate, socioeconomic, usually in a major metropolitan area, you have right now um, no small number of families um, who dedicate just a jaw-dropping amount of money and obsession, mm -hmm. um, outside expertise, all of this stuff, ba with one goal in mind, and that goal is getting into a school with the lowest acceptance rate, the most exclusive, getting into the school that's turning away the most other people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something a little sick about that being the yardstick for what makes right. a school desirable and a place that you think you're gonna get a great education. And, and then if it doesn't happen, Oh. Young Frank is devastating. Yeah. I mean, you know, why is it Young Frank? Well, <laughs> name I picked at random, I don't know. Young Frank did just fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, a, lo a, lot, of, a lot of these, uh, you know, um, I tell a story in the book, um, and I still, and I've repeated it um, in settings like this, and it still blows my mind, but to give you an example of, of, of what happens or the psychology we're creating, there's a, uh, a psychology lecturer at Cornell University whom I interviewed for the book. Um, and I didn't know what we were going to talk about. Someone just said they thought he had an interesting perspective on it. And then I asked him what he made of this admissions mania, as I call it in the subtitle of the book. And he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, every year I teach an introductory uh, psychology lecture um, at Cornell University. So we're talking about Cornell, one of the Ivy League schools. Um, but not, but the Ivy League school with the highest acceptance rate, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's about 200 students in the, in the lecture. Most of them are juniors and seniors. After that, sophomores, no freshmen. So none of them are just, have just come out of the admissions grinder. They've all had at least a couple years to let it settle. And just out of curiosity, he, he, in the first class of every, of every semester, he says, how many of you are disappointed that you're not at Yale, Princeton, or Harvard right now? And he said routinely, semester after semester, 60, 60% of the kids mm -hmm. raise their hands, right? They could not be in a much better situation. They are utterly privileged, utterly blessed. They're at Cornell, and they're still measuring themselves by what didn't happen, mm -hmm. and they're still haunted by it. Um, I don't think that's good for them, yeah. and I don't think it's good for any of us that we've created that sort of psychology in people. Yeah. Six, not too strong a word. So. Uh, the mics are waiting. Is this our first question? Yes, question. So my question, um, Mr. Bruni, not young Frank. Frank, Frank. <laughs> Frank, okay. You can call me not young Frank, but Frank is good. Frank, Frank, good. Frank the elder. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the fraternity um, and sorority system that are so prevalent on our campuses? Yeah, um, I'm, I'll be really blunt. I'm not a big fan of fraternities and sororities, and I will acknowledge off the bat that um, there are many fraternities and sororities that do extraordinary social service and exist in some measure to do that and are wonderful citizens of their communities. Um, but I think college is best used um, to, as I said before, become more fluent in diversity, um, to meet and mingle um, with, as, with as diverse an array of people as you can because you'll find later in life that we sort of end up getting channeled by the way our communities are structured, by the way our professions are structured. You end up getting channeled into fairly narrow bands of people. So before that happens, um, make sure you have met and learned from and been enlarged by as many different kinds of people as possible. Unfortunately, most fraternities and most sororities um, are fairly homogenous environments. Um, and I wish colleges and universities would do more to steer students away from homogenous environments for those four years um, and to challenge and provoke them a little more. There's, there's but it's a, not, I, if I can just add something, it's not, I, I, because I don't want to sound like I'm beating up on fraternities and sororities. Um, it's not just a phenomenon of those. There are a lot of schools right now, because college has become this consumer good in too many instances, and they're all trying to promise the most fun or the most comfortable experience, there are a lot of colleges that are giving kids residential options where you can live only with theater majors, or you can live only with fellow environmentalists, or only with fellow foodies. I have the exact same reservation about that as I do about fraternities and sororities. First of all, I want to tell you that I really enjoyed your column this morning, but probably not for, uh, for a lot of reasons, but the real reason is I could figure out how old you are. Um, and you're much younger than I thought you were. So I'm I 50. Will, 
call you Frank. Yeah. Uh, Frank. Um, call me middle-aged Frank. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned something. Um, I'm really curious, uh, as a post-educator, um, one of my concerns about what's happening in education, not only in college, but also in elementary and secondary school, is this call for a national curriculum. Mm. Um, so I'll just, it's a very controversial question. I'll do a double on you. Are we going to talk about the Common Core? We're not going to talk okay, about right. the Common Core, because the Common Core could be one national but it's not the only one. Standards, uh, so. You're talking a lot about the private Ivies and the public school versus the private school. And private school kids learn a totally different curriculum than public school kids do. Um, and I won't go there, but because, uh, and therefore they learn different things. Well, do you believe a, 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 a core curriculum is a good idea? Especially in this age of diversity and in this age of um, economic instability? I think, I think um, I mean, a lot of people would mean different things by a core curriculum. I mean, there, there, there are many gradations and degrees of that. Um, I absolutely believe that there are certain, um, not, there's, there's a certain body of knowledge, a baseline body of knowledge that we should make sure every kid in this country uh, graduates high school with. Um, certain matters of national and world history, that sort of thing. Um, whether I would, I don't know that that rises or should rise to the level of a national curriculum, um, but I think there should be um, some baseline standards um, that we, if, if, not, if not enforcing them nationally, we should at least have a robust enough uh, set of incentives and penalties, um, which is the way it's typically worked, to try to lead everyone in that direction. Um, I, I often, I often think we understand that defense is a national issue. Um, and that is something we handle out of the federal budget um, because we know that our future as a nation is dependent on that. I think our future as a nation is dependent on um, the, how well-educated our populace is. And sadly, history has shown that many locales left entirely to their own devices will do a terrible job um, and will misreport how well their kids are doing. Um, and so we do need some mechanisms and some standards um, and some baseline requirements nationally to make sure that just by dint of what geography you're born into, um, you don't receive an inferior, edu inferior education that not only puts you back, but that we all pay a price for as a country. So I'll, I'll leave. But I'll ask you this. So then should there be national testing? Yeah, I think there should Standardized be. Standardized national testing. Well, I mean, again, it's... Uh, to what degree? There should be some. Yes, we need to know how kids in Louisiana are doing compared to kids in Washington State. Um, we can get carried away with it. So I'm, I'm well aware and I understand that a lot of educators and a lot of parents feel like their kids are spending way too much time in school taking test after test. Um, I believe there's got to be a way or there is a way to do the right kind of national testing that allows us to know how kids in different areas of the country are faring, that allows us to make sure that no one's getting a crappy education, but that doesn't turn schools into a day in, day out testing prep and testing siege. And who, I'll just, <clears throat> and who gets to decide what the questions are? I mean, you know, committees of, committees of people who know best and, and are kind of with the normal checks and balances that are built into that, you know, built into a lot of things. Thanks for the questions. Great opportunity to uh, give a commercial for our next speaker. It happens to be, I think it's next week, it's, uh, and Arnie Duncan, uh, Secretary of Education, who he'll have a lot to say about that question. Who, uh, <laughs> but he, he has to watch his words much more carefully yeah. than I do. So, so, uh, uh, but he's agreed to be with us, and those are exactly the kind of questions that I know he'll be uh, eager to engage with. Uh, let, let me uh, uh, ask you this about another really arresting column that, that you wrote not too long ago, uh, Frank, and it, it, it gets at a question we, that we wrestle with here. Is college about career prepare, preparation or about uh, a, a larger, broader preparation for life? And to the extent it's not one or the, all one or the other, you know, how do you find that balance point? Um, I'd like you to tell the story for those who missed the column. You, were, you said you were asked to name a transformative educational experience 
and it took you a minute, and then you uh, then it came to you, and it and it sort of uh, informs that question that I well, posed. Yeah, I, w I was on the stage like this one, and um, someone much like yourself, not nearly as distinguished and eloquent, though, uh -huh. um, <laughs> asked me... Um, uh, asked also more rude, because he didn't tell you the questions ahead of time. No, right. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, and, I, and I was stumped, and so it was a very genuine answer. I was asked what was the most transformative education experience. And, um, and I, for some reason, in my head popped the image of a professor I had. I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and I was an English major, and I took a number of classes with an English professor there um, named Ann Hall. Um, and I remembered in the instant when I was asked that question, just kind of seeing her in front of the class, and she would, she was so in love with Shakespeare, and this was a Shakespeare class, and she would be talking about one of the plays. This was, a, I think, a course that was entirely on uh, the tragedies. Um, and um, she would, in talking about it, occasionally recite a line, and her whole body would sway. I mean, it was almost, it was sensual on the verge of erotic. And I heard her, um, and I heard her saying uh, the phrase, Cordelia, stay a little, um, which is from King Lear, which was her favorite play, and because I um, obviously have no independence, quickly became my favorite play. Um, <laughs> and I just remember how, when she talked about that line and when she intoned that line, there was something I learned in that moment about just how much freight a few words could carry, um, and, 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 just, and about how closely you had to look at them to understand all the things they might mean. Mm -hmm. And I felt like in that moment, um, which was such a gift and I think struck to the very heart of what education could do, um, I, I learned that there was a reward to close attention, whether it be to a text, whether it be to a person, whether it be to a binge-watching experience on television. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think that also spoke to what's so important about a liberal arts education. Um, you can't say that spending an hour thinking about and dissecting the line, stay a little, in King Lear, has any direct professional application. Um, but learning to pay close attention to what people say and how they say it, um, learning that the more attentive you are, the greater the rewards are. Well, I can't think of a single career that that doesn't translate into. Interestingly, shortly after I wrote that column, two, two great things happened. One was Ann Hall, who didn't remember me, um, <laughs> read the column. She was now, she's now at University of Pennsylvania, and she got in touch, and I, uh, and I, um, and I went down to Philadelphia on the train and took her out oh. for dinner and got a second column out of it. So this is really good. <laughs> when one column leads to another. Um, and the second thing that happened was, which kind of g gets us to the political world, yeah. which you know, is um, I got an email from um, a Democratic political, op political operative with whom I'm friendly. Don't hold that against me. Um, Some of uh, my best friends. Named Joel Benenson, who was President Obama's chief pollster for the 2008 and 2012 campaigns, now is not only the chief pollster for Hillary Clinton's campaign, but also one of her chief strategists. Um, and he told me um, that he felt like nothing in his education turned out to be more applicable to and better preparation for being a pollster than his study of Shakespeare in college. Mm -hmm. And I got a third column out of that, right? So, <laughs> so Stay a Little not only taught me a lot about language, I got three columns nice. out of that. Well, for those of us who are fathers of four daughters, King Lear's a little rough on you. you yes. Know? <laughs> Hopefully all of your daughters were Cordelia-like and yeah. not Goneril-like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on their better days, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, maybe, do we have a question waiting? Please. Hi, I really enjoy your columns. Thank you, you opened up the sports store, so I want to ask a question about the Washington professional football team. Uh-oh, Redskins. I, would, I don't use that word. When will their name change, and should it change? Um, you know, I, I understand both sides of that one. I, I think it should change. Um, I, think, I think less is lost than is gained by changing the name. Um, I have no idea when it will change. Um, uh, I, I just, I have no more insight into that than you do. Um, I, I, I think the name should change. Um, I don't find the people, the people who feel invested sentimentally in all that and keeping it the way it is, I don't find them outrageous and ridiculous and they don't make me super angry, but if it were up to me, I'd change the name. I don't know, how do you, 
I'd love to see a show of hands. How many people would change the Redskins' name and would not? All right, well, if this room has sway, it's done, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just, that settles that. Hello, Mr. Bruni. Um, I'm glad I can come no, here today. It's, we're on a first name. It's middle-aged <laughs> Frank. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Um, my name is Richard. Um, um, yeah, I think I'm glad you can come today for, for, to Purdue, um, a place where diversity is valued, being my fact that I'm, I'm, I'm personally from China, mainland China. So my question today is not about diversity, actually. It's more about one of the most experiences I had at Purdue that transformed me, transformed me, uh, me completely, which is Christianity, Christian fellowship I joined. Um, especially yesterday, I heard the news from um, Yahoo about Kim Davis. Mm. Um, just hearing from me, I kind of touched a lot by her. Um, so my question today for you is, um, do you think on college campus or just in the world generally, do we need more progressive Christians or general people who can who, who seek to adapt to change, who seek to interpret Christianity according to modern philosophies and assumptions, how to make Christianity more livable, or do we need more conservative Christians or general students who stick to their faith, who stick to their principles and what they believe in? Thank you. I think I think we have to we need to have respect for both. Um, I don't think it's up to a college or to me to kind of direct whether you want progressive. Christianity, which would mean very different things to very different people, or whether you want conservative Christianity, and what does that mean? Does that mean um, biblical literalism? Does that mean um, Christianity coupled with conservative political impulses? Um, I think we need to have respect for all of that. Um, the issue with Kim Davis is, is uh, the issue that many of us have with her is not that we don't respect her right to believe what she believes. Um, I don't respect her decision um, as a public servant whose job is to execute the laws um, of the land to decide that there's one law that she's not going to. She can go to church on Sunday, or she can go to church every day, um, and she can hold on to her belief about same-sex marriage, um, and she can rail in her heart and in the pew um, about what's happened in the public square. But she cannot pick and choose as a matter of what her job is, which laws to follow. And can I, and, and can I, and I want to say, I want to say one more thing about Kim Davis, which I think strangely has not been said enough. Let us not forget that there was a, there was a time in this country, not all that many decades ago, um, when, <clears throat> when there were states where interracial marriage was illegal. If Kim Davis had gotten into this by denying marriage licenses to mixed race couples, I, I don't think that anyone would have be having any debate about this. So why it's okay for her to single out same-sex couples when we've moved to a point where the law of the land is different, I don't see why that's OK. So while, just thank you for a very interesting question. So just to press the point, though, to follow up, did you feel the same way about mayors who uh, refused to uh, enforce the sanctuary laws as they were on the books, and, uh, for instance, about illegal immigration, or the um, referendum produced, popularly voted, rules about gay marriage that applied in California and other places? Did you write, did you? In, wait, the California question, I don't understand, I'm sorry. There were people who declined to, who, who went ahead and uh, uh, granted licenses in contravention of the law as it stood at that time. So I, I don't did remember you have that. the same view? I don't remember that situation super well, but yeah. um, those licenses, at the end of the day, those licenses they granted were worthless because they couldn't, I mean, they had no legal weight yeah. because they were, so it was, a, it was more of a symbolic gesture, um, and they weren't refusing, they weren't denying anybody right. anything, and what they were doing was sort of more symbolic and ceremonial. Right. Um, uh, sanctuary cities, I have to admit, that's not an issue that I'm, that I'm super mm -hmm. up on, but if you are, um, as a local official, um, bucking uh, what is clearly a matter of state or federal law, yeah, I have a problem yeah. with that. Resignation I mean, I believe is I, probably the better course. I, 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 I believe that we have systems in place for a reason. Yeah. Um, and I understand Kim Davis's complaint, or not her complaint, but the complaint of a lot of people, is the Supreme Court sort of um, short-circuited a lot of those systems. But the Supreme Court does that in instances. That is part of the system. Right. Thanks. Um, so we're, oh, great. If we have more, please. Um, so as a person that um, uh, obviously speaks to a uh, mass audience, do you believe that um, if, 
if you're going to take that position to speak, um, that there should be um, uh, some sort of uh, limit to how much, um, because especially with, um, we were talking about, you know, a lot of hot button social issues, um, and uh, just particular example, the love wins hashtag. Um, and there were some people who were posting it over and over and over on the day that the ruling came through. Um, do you believe that um, there's a certain point where that can be out of taste or um, there should be a call for moderation? I don't, I, 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 I'm kind of not clear what you're asking. I mean, I don't think we should ever say you can or cannot post a hashtag on, on Twitter or on your Facebook page. Um, if you believe that love won on that day, um, and you want to say that as many times and as loudly as you like, I mean, that's the essence of free speech. Similarly, if you believe, um, as Kim Davis does and many other people do, that, um, that common sense and decency lost on that day, um, you should have decency lost hashtag and you should do it as much as you want. I mean, that's the essence of free speech. Um, where we get, into, I have no problem with any kind of volume or plenitude of that. Where we get into trouble um, is when people um, go beyond exercising their right to speech and believe that they can circumvent the law or invent a law for just themselves. Um, but no, as far as your expression, no. I mean, I, I would prefer um, that people express their views and make known what they want to make known um, in a way that's constructive because I happen, uh, I happen to be a fan of compromise um, in government and a lot of things. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of common ground. One of my greatest worries about our country is that the sort of balkanization of the media and of entertainment and of the <laughs> internet um, has led us to have fewer, po fewer points of common reference um, and fewer points of consensus. Um, but that said, I would never restrict um, how often and how passionately people can and do express themselves. Great. Thank you for the question. Over here. Hi, my name is Sabir. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us today. It's, uh, I'm, I'm enjoying this. My son is here in the audience with me. Um, my question, given the versatility of uh, subjects that you have uh, worked in, um, in my observation, the, the society that we see around us, and not just U.S., but maybe globally, is becoming anti-intellectual at a very high speed and more into sound bites and like you said, the balkanization, the, the technologies that are supposed to bring us together, you know, uh, when, when first of all, have been used or have just incidentally made us more polarized so we can seek yeah, our partisan. own point of view and just say, well, there it is, I'm validated right there because some guy said so. Right. Uh, do you think our colleges are doing enough or maybe, to put it bluntly, maybe are part of the problem where they become industrialized enough that it's not about uh, uh, festering various intellectual thought versus, you know, right. hey, we'll get you into a job. Uh, right. Do you think our colleges are helping that uh, cause or are basically just part of the same rut that everybody else is? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Well, for starters, you've touched on something that I've written about that I think about a lot that I speak about a lot um, when I'm in groups like this, um, I'm hugely concerned about exactly what you're concerned about, which is that um, technology and the internet um, and social media and these things that could be used to broaden our worlds and open up the universe to us as never before. In fact, the way 95% of people use them is to curate the most narrow, self-affirming, echo chamber experience possible. Um, and we can't control what people are doing at their computers or with their uh, hundreds of TV channels. Um, we can talk about it and try to kind of tell them why we think that's a bad idea. Colleges aren't the root of the problem. Um, colleges aren't the main contributor to the problem, but I do think colleges are places that can, as other places cannot, push back at this. Um, there's an opportunity for college administrators to engage in a sort of social engineering that doesn't exist at lower school levels and won't exist later in life. Um, I think colleges uh, should require um, that students take more courses than they do and not let them treat the course offerings the way they do the internet and only follow the social media feeds that they agree with. I think colleges 
could be geographically organized so that there was maximum interaction between different kinds of students and perspectives. Um, because this other tendency exists, and there's no way for us to really restrict it in, in, a, in a country where we believe in free speech, I would like to see colleges take that problem by the horns and really push back as best they can. Good. Thank you. Um, over there, maybe? Hi, Frank. Thank you for coming. Um, oh. My name is Namisha. I'm an MD-PhD student, so in my field, technical education is incredibly important. Um, and I agree with you that diversity education is like very important, especially, and again, in technical fields, working with teams, seeing patients, all that kind of stuff. But how important do you think it is for students to balance that technical expertise that they get at the university and that education with the diversity education that um, is so important? Um, you do, by diversity education, you mean like liberal arts stuff or also just kind of meeting different kinds of people or? Both, all of it. I think it all has to go into it. Listen, I, mean, I would never say, um, and I don't believe, that college uh, can or should be a purely intellectual experience. I mean, I would that we lived in a world where everyone had that sort of um, ability to not care about economics um, or what was going to happen the day after they graduate. But we don't, and I'm a realist. Um, that said, if people approach college as too much of a technical education, um, as too much of a vocational education, they're ignoring the fact that we don't really know with confidence what's going to happen to the job market. We're ignoring the fact that technical skills change all the time. I mean, the ones that, that can be parlayed into, into a profession. I mean, science advances. You have to be retrained and all that. So the one thing you can count on is learning how to learn um, and cultivating a sort of nimble, adaptable intellect so that as the economy changes in unpredictable ways, as the job market changes in unpredictable ways, as, as what science can do and what technology is capable of outpaces what you learned at this static moment in time, you at least have the right sort of character, um, flexibility, and intellect um, to continually reinvent yourself. Because I do think we're living increasingly in a world where people will reinvent themselves two, three, four times over the course of their professional lives. Thank you. Hi, hi, Frank. Um, also, I don't know if we're on a first name basis, but hi, Mitch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right about it. Um, Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, Frank, I'm studying to be a journalist, actually, so I, I admire your work an awful lot, and I um, just wanted to say thank you for all you do. Um, you. My question is about, I guess you said, you talked a bit earlier about how college should be an experience of putting yourself out of your comfort zone and exploring, I guess, places and people that you wouldn't usually um, be around. And I'm, I'm an international student, so mm -hmm. that's sort of... Where are you from? Um, I'm from Australia. Oh. Yeah. But um, <laughs> any, anyway, um, I had a transformative um, experience myself when I came, I came here for exchange, and I ended up liking it so much I said, oh, I kind of want to stay. And I feel like I wouldn't have found out a lot about myself if I hadn't put myself so far out of my comfort zone that I exactly. traveled to the other side of the world. And so I was just wondering if you thought, and- It's a long walkabout, right? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, boomerang doesn't come back if I throw it here. But um, no, I was just wondering, and this is also a question for, um, I guess for Mitch as well, but do you think um, exchange should be something that is a little more encouraged? I know it's encouraged, but you know what I mean? It's a, it's a very important thing, I think, to go somewhere else and sort of experience something new while you're young. And I know a lot of people who haven't really even considered it. And so do you think there should be more of an emphasis on yeah. that in college education? I'm going to let you take it first, because I've been <laughs> talk, talk, talk. Well, bra you know, thank you and bravo. You know, it, it, we believe that fervently. And in fact, uh, uh, we, uh, one thing that I uh, learned uh, about Purdue, there, there were so many things that I was thrilled about. One thing that I, it seemed obvious we needed to improve was exactly this. Only 16 or 17 percent of, of Boilermakers had uh, even a brief international experience while they went, went through this university. We're out to a, at least double that, really the goal. We'll raise, we'll, when we get there, we'll raise the goal. And we have uh, we've established a program. It turned out that a, a modest stipend, which we now offer, um, uh, it's basically enough to get somebody there and back, was enough to, to uh, uh, induce a lot of students to study internationally. And um, 
Uh, so the, the number's up dramatically, and, and we're headed for uh, uh, that doubling goal. I think we can get there another couple of cohorts. But yes, we quite agree, and uh, I'll say two more things about it. With full respect to your homeland, I'm always happiest when I meet a student who's going not to Australia or Britain or Ireland, although I think that's swell, but to somewhere really alien to their mm -hmm. experience, to Africa, uh, to uh, Asia, uh, and uh, somewhere where the language is uh, uh, different. And uh, so we, uh, we don't require that, but we do encourage that. And the last thing, and Frank sort of got to this, we are blessed to be an international campus. Um, about one in six of our undergrads, uh, uh, more than four in 10 of our graduate students, and yet we don't do a good enough job of fostering the interaction and all the learning that can come from that. I, I tell our freshmen every year, don't miss this chance. You could learn. We want you to study internationally, but you could, you could learn as much from the student in the next room if you make a small effort as, as you might from the next lecture you attend. So we thank you for the chance to, to uh, state our, our enthusiastic agreement. Yeah, you want to? I concur jump on with. That? I okay. concur not just because you're stand, You're not not just because you're my host. <laughs> I concur with everything he said. Um, okay. Yeah, I sometimes feel like it's a cheat when someone said when someone says I studied abroad in England. I'm like, oh yeah, right. You know. <laughs> um, but I uh, said I was brave. I just, no, and, yeah. uh, but I, I want. I just want to like add to a couple of things that. Um, I guess if he's, if he's doing Mitch, I'm doing Mitch. Everybody, yeah, Mitch, does. Um, everybody. Does. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's interesting, I, I think it's hugely important, and um, when I, when I bang, bang on, as I frequently do, about how much I dislike the US News and World Report rankings, I point out that actually, if you do buy access to the rankings on the website, there's a lot of information on it that's interesting that doesn't influence a school's ranking. One of the things is you can, you can find out for every school what percentage of kids at that school go abroad to study for at least a full semester. Um, and I've often said to, when I talk to secondary school students, I would want to choose a school that had more rather than fewer of those students because A, it suggests to me that my fellow students have an intellectual curiosity that's going to benefit me, and B, they're going to come back to campus mm -hmm. with those experience and those stories. Um, much like you have international students here that you're not being, I mean, you are one of them, but that you're not taking full advantage of your education if you're not making a point of meeting them. My niece, my eldest niece, just finished um, uh, her first year at Johns Hopkins. She's now entering her second year. And the most exciting thing I heard from her, I mean, not that she was most excited about, but that I was when she began there, was when she told me that her roommate was from Nigeria. Mm. And I thought, that's what education should be. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello, Frank. Uh, I have a question about how technology is changing journalism right now. I see that a lot at the New York Times, like uh, videos accompanying certain, certain articles or visualizations that help you understand what's happening within the story. Uh, so how has new technology changed how you produce content and work? And how is the New York Times taking advantage of all this new technology uh, to produce new content in the future? Um, it's, it's changing journalism and what we do a lot. Um, part of what it changes is the metabolism of it. You know, so um, now the way people consume news since they can get news on their smartphone, on their tablet, as they're traveling around, nobody wants to know what happened yesterday. Everybody wants to know what happened 30 minutes ago. Um, so what you see at the Times is you see stories being updated frequently. You see all of these byways of the website. Like uh, in politics, there's this thing called first draft. And that's where things that are not full-fledged stories but there are a couple paragraphs that can tell you what happened just now that hasn't yet made its way into a full story rendering. Um, on the opinion side, it doesn't affect me a lot, but for instance, um, uh, with the first Republican presidential debate, um, instead of doing a traditional column uh, that, that day or in that span of the week, um, I, I, I watched the debate, wrote as I watched, and I had something, I had, a, I had an opinion column about the debate up on the web, I think 20 minutes after the debate ended. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that wouldn't have been doable, um, nor would people have been looking for it five years ago, but now um, it's more par for the course in the way and the way that more of us are operating. Um, we're doing as much as we can with video. It's very expensive to produce. It's hard to get the right people to make good video. Um, so we're doing as much as we can 
um, without, you know, within certain budgetary constraints. Um, and then we've certainly gotten much more sophisticated with graphics and, and photos. But you, I don't know how many of you read the Times online, but we've done a couple of signature projects that have, that have combined like video as you read. There was one recently done by Ian Urbina about piracy and other things, high crimes on the high seas. Uh, the first one we did was called Snowfall, about an avalanche. Those are extremely technically challenging and expensive to produce, so we can't do as much of it as we'd like, um, but we're moving to do more and more of it. Thank well, uh, currently the internet's kind of blurring the boundaries between, uh, say, cable and newsprint journalism, like how you consume that. So do you view the Wall Street Journal as a, say, in five or 10 years as a serious competitor with like CNN or MSNBC within those similar markets? Well, the Wall Street Journal is, is, is a different kind of thing because A, they still uh, devote uh, the lion's share of their resources to business news and reporting. Um, mm -hmm. And they still have a customer base that's very heavy, um, heavily tilted that way, mm -hmm. uh, and also toward a conservative political audience. Um, so I don't think the Wall Street Journal is trying to compete with CNN. Or, I mean, if they are, I'm not really aware of it. Thank you very much. Over here. Hi, uh, Frank. Nice to meet you. Uh, name's Jacob. You can hey, call Jacob. me Jake. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, in your craft, uh, words are, are really important um, and obviously uh, I think very influential. Um, I think political correctness is a new sort of buzzword that's uh, come to the forefront recently uh, and rightfully so. Um, do you feel that this has affected you uh, either one way or another? Um, I know a middle ground is always hard to reach, um, but do you feel sort of shackled by it? Do you feel like it's important for the diverse you know, audience that is in front of you? How do you feel like political correctness and, and the new ways it's coming to light is affecting you? Um, well, I mean, people mean different things by the phrase political correctness. And that phrase has been around for a while. But I think what you're referring to is the latest iteration of, of it we're seeing where um, um, it affects all of us in journalism because there's a quickness to offense. Um, and there's a quickness to negative interpretation um, that I think is not, is not really ideal right now. Um, and yet you, you have to take it into account because if you're trying to say something serious and meaningful and constructive, um, the last thing you want to do is shoot yourself in the foot um, by doing something that even if it's just 2% of people are going to find offensive and even if you think they're finding it offensive is a little bit hypersensitive and ridiculous, you don't want the conversation about what you're doing to be derailed by that. It's just a silly it's a silly distraction to invite. So I think about it a lot. Um, I don't think about it in terms of being shackled. I think about it in terms of not being foolish and being careful and making sure I don't undercut the main thing I'm trying to do by wandering you know, into a bit of bramble um, that I could have avoided. Thank you, Jake. I just, I just, he and I just call him Jay now. Yeah, I, yeah. Just first <laughs> Because we're, we were, we're more intimate than you and I. It's a very good question. So let's go over here. These questions yeah. are great, by the way. Really, wow. Yep. My brain hurts. Sorry. Hi, Ask Frank. me what food I eat or something. something easy. <laughs> well, this is going to kind of take it in a different direction. Oh, good. Um, or I think so. Yeah, it is right. good. Um, so uh, my major is organizational leadership and supervision. It's now in the Purdue Polytechnic Institute. Um, and uh, being someone that's very heavily involved with that, with um, I think it's really pushed that leadership is a huge thing and something that I've learned in the years that I think isn't really stressed a lot is that sometimes if everyone's a leader, like that's not, first of all, that's not possible because then everyone's leading and then mm -hmm. no one's, you're, like you can't be a leader without yeah. followers. You sort of rob the word of its meaning at that point. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> And so I guess my question to you is, what are your thoughts about not necessarily being the leader, but having the courage to be the first follower in that sense? So like coming up to, so like if someone's leading something and they're like, yeah, I want to do this. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, no one wants to do it. But then having the courage to have, to be the first follower in that sense. Well, you sort of, I mean, I, if we're going to talk about leadership seriously, not just because, you know, I'm talking too much, but um, I'd like to hear from Mitch. Because um, you're looking at someone who governed a state and, and right. is the president of a university and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, all I can say is, all I can do is echo back what you said. I think you raised an interesting point, which is I think it can take as much courage um, and maybe more character to yeah. be the first follower than to be the leader. Um, I think that's a great point. 
I think it's a great question, and in, in the Polytechnic Institute, I hope, will uh, break new ground and, and, and really, uh, in, in a way that the College of Technology has been pursuing for a long time, you know, uh, leadership's becoming a little blurred these days. We know that a lot of the most Im important work uh, in any realm these days is done by teams. Leadership may rotate. You may be the you may be the follower on the, on today's task, and you may the, be the most expert and the most uh, uh, credible on the task that comes along next. So, uh, do, you, do you think Donald Trump's going to be a good good rotator? Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, ask me. I, one, one distinction, maybe the only one I take out of, take out of this right life, there. is that uh, I actually uh, uh, may be one of the few people who had a chance to say, Donald, you're fired. And, uh, <laughs> so, um, but you can, anyway. You can expand on that story if you like. <laughs> well, he had, the li he had a license uh, temporarily for a casino in Indiana when I got elected, and uh, they were trying to rush it through midnight decision thing, and we said, maybe not, and we took a closer look and decided they weren't what Indiana needed. So I said, Donald, you're fired. <laughs> and, he said, and he said, Mitch, you're a loser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like the, stop, like the stop clock, he's right now and then, that'd be one time. <laughs> But I, and I hope you understand what I'm, what I'm saying. I think, I think it, it's a very good point. And we're, we're certainly in many, many ways here, not just in your college, but I think trying to foster the skills of collaboration and uh, teamwork uh, and uh, in, in the, whatever lies ahead for you, and I'm sure it's going to be a great career. There, I predict there will be lots of occasions when you are a strong second or third or member of the team, and there are going to be occasions when you are looked to for leadership. So please be ready. Okay, so we've got, uh, uh-oh, um, I was going to say we've got three in three minutes, so I think uh, you've been waiting the longest, and let's, uh, let's, if you can keep the questions short, and we can spill over just a little, we can accommodate everybody. We better stop with those uh, uh, right after David there. Um, hi, I'm also a student studying to be a journalist, and I'm graduating soon, so I wanted to ask about the technology again, and like, how um, do you see it kind of affecting students in their writing capacities? Like, because I have a minor in creative writing, and I've noticed when I'm taking um, classes on journalism, writing for a newspaper, the like the errors that we see, mm. like learning how to do like the inverted pyramid, and like in the real world, which obviously I haven't seen yet, do you, do you see a change happening with students graduating and coming with all these technologies that they're using? Well, I see a number of changes, and they're not all just related to te technology. A lot of them are related to the marketplace. The, the, the journalistic landscape that has grown around technology. So you mentioned the inverted pyramid. Some people may not know what that is. That's what you what you learn in news writing 101, which is that you put the most important stuff, uh, the most you know, the, and then you kind of like widen it as, as it goes along. The who, what, why, where, and the lead of a story. Um, there's not a lot of news written that way anymore. So the entire journalistic landscape and economy has changed, and we've moved and are moving ever more rapidly into a kind of European model where we don't have as much objectively rendered, deliberately flat, neutral news writing, and we have an enormous amount of commentary. Um, and so what I notice is that uh, it, students like you, having, been, having come of age uh, when the internet has more of that, um, tend to write in a kind of looser, more personal, more free, associate, more free associative way. It leads to some writing that's better than I ever would expect from, from students your age, but it also leads uh, to some sloppiness because if, if, if there are no rules and everything is just how you feel it, uh, that can much too easily become an invitation to disarray. So just to add quickly to that, so for somebody entering into the journalistic world, do you see that like possibly hurting them? Like having that more like not as much grammar and all of those strict rules? Well, not, not, not I mean, not having grammar will always, uh, will always hurt because, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I'm a stickler. If I look in my outbox and I notice that I sent an email with a T-H-E-I-R, where I meant to put T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, I mean, that's 10 minutes of my day ruined as I sulk about it. You know? um, uh, I, believe, I believe that you know, God is in the details and God is in grammar. I mean, I, re I really think that it's a reflection of discipline. It's a reflection yeah. of caring. It's a reflection of taking the time to be informed and prepared. And there are enough fogies like me out there, um, that if you spell poorly, um, if you have poor grammar, um, people will make 
assumptions about you based on it. And it's just silly to lose points in an arena where you don't mm -hmm. have to lose points. Let me state it to you positively, as I have to thousands of young people by now. Uh, if you do master a reasonable facility with the English language, to speak it and to write it in a reasonably articulate way, you will set yourself apart. People will think you're smarter than you are. <laughs> Be because it has become increasingly rare. And I say that as, <laughs> as if it has, yeah. So go for it, you girl, you're doing the right thing. Over here. Hi. Um, we just kind of touched on like the whole issue of like uh, stepping beyond one's comfort zone and embracing like diversity. And Purdue has a great diversity of, like President Daniel said, we have one sixth international population. And as an immigrant American who isn't an international student, I observe um, that we have great diversity, but the inclusion of this diversity is not as well facilitated. So how can students at Purdue, especially in a state that's nearly landlocked, but we have this great resource to students all over the world, how can we promote the idea of inclusion within this entire like atmosphere of the campus? Well, I mean, you can, I mean, whatever organizations, for instance, you're a part of, you can, you can make a big effort to reach out. Um, you can make a big effort to reach out, as corporations frequently do um, <laughs> when they're behaving well, um, you can make an effort. No, and, and some of them behave very well. I, uh, you know, some of them, many corporations were far ahead of the rest of the country on things like immigration reform. Well, they're still ahead of the rest of the country on things like immigration reform um, and, and same-sex marriage and stuff like that. But, I mean, you, you have some, some agency here. I mean, you, you yourself are a member of this community, um, and whether it's, the, or it's, whether it's the organizations you choose to take part in, um, the contribution to make, make to those organizations, which includes the effort to bring people in from the outside, to bring a diversity of people in from the outside, um, you, you have a say in this. Um, and as a kind of consumer of the Purdue experience, I mean, I haven't kind of looked at a booklet or whatever, but my guess, what I love about schools of this size, of this scale, is my guess is there are an array of activities, organizations, clubs, um, special seminars, et cetera, um, that if you really took a serious look, give you any number of opportunities to go inhabit a milieu that is not your own um, and to go do something that you have no idea if you're any good at. Um, and like I said earlier, and I don't mean to repeat myself, like if you're gonna fail, fail now, because the mm -hmm. price of failure becomes higher the older you are. And by the time you're middle-aged Frank, the price of failure is enormous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a great question and for choosing Purdue. Uh, Dr. Sanders. Thank you. I was wondering, in your travels and in your interviews, what have you heard as the best suggestions for fighting the increasing regard for a college education as merely a credentialing experience and as a corporate training ground? Um, the best way to fight it, or? Yes. Hmm. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do my bit by, you know, by flapping my gums on a stage like this, I'm trying to do my little bit, but um, I think the best way to fight it is for all of those of us who know otherwise. Um, to explain that, to tell our stories, um, and to kind of make people understand, I think sometimes learning and college learning takes on a sort of fussy connotation in people's lives, and they don't realize like how much of their everyday lives involve the kind of, involves the kind of intellectual exp exploration that college is all about. You know, whether it's the way they're surfing the channels at night, um, you know, whether it's the book they're reading, I mean, all of that is about marinating in ideas and language and all those things um, that college at its best exalts. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm a senior in agricultural communications, and in my senior seminar class, we've been discussing on whether or not communications is a craft or a profession. So my question is, with what you do at the New York Times, do you see that as a craft or a profession? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't, I guess it is a craft. I don't see it that way because that feels um, overly self-conscious and precious to me. Um, so I guess I kind of experience it in my bones as a profession. But I think, I think almost any profession um, is only done best when someone brings to it um, the passion and the care um, that they would lavish on a craft. Holding the question, or uh, got a quick one? Yeah. This question goes to both of you. What would you do if you could right now to engage the students and the faculty and staff 
and defining goals for this university to better this university into the future. Well, I'd like to think, I, I, I believe, and uh, that's an organic conversation that goes on all the time. Uh, we, we don't suffer here, thank goodness, for, from a, a bashfulness among faculty, students, or staff. Uh, hear from people on an absolutely hourly basis. And, uh, and that's, a great, that's a great thing. And so I, I, I think it, it grows organically. Now that said, um, if you're going to get something done, you, you can't be talking about it perpetually. And so... Uh, we have staked ourselves to several major projects, but as we advance those, we're thinking about the next one's the next one. You can expect to hear uh, uh, in the, this fall about at least one or two more big initiatives, and they have bubbled up, in this case, from uh, largely from, uh, they're, they're entirely faculty uh, generated, but, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it's just been my uh, conviction and experience in more than one job that, this world particularly, if you tread water, you will sink. And as, an, as a university, we've got to be moving forward. We're gonna make, when you do that, you're gonna make mistakes. Not every uh, judgment and every initiative will be a bullseye. But, um, you know, higher ed, I think, uh, uh, in too many places, too many cases, uh, has been um, almost reactionary in its, uh, uh, almost ossified in its um, uh, attachment to the way things have been. And, um, uh, so uh, we, are, we are certainly trying here. We are trying to involve everybody who wants a say in figuring out how this great university can um, be uh, even greater and, and, and more uh, relevant uh, tomorrow, whatever tomorrow brings. Please improve on that. I can improve on that. Um, so I'm going to defer that to you. I just want to say I want to thank everybody for coming. Tonight. I, wanna, um, I guess we have a lot of Times readers here. Um, uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> Um, and uh, and I would just I would just say I, I really hope everybody does appreciate what an incredibly special environment you have here. Um, and for the students in the audience, um, the years go by really quickly. You're not going to get these years back. You know, rummage across this landscape with every with all the energy um, and enthusiasm you can, and, and pluck every shoot of grass and flower that there is to, to be plucked. Well, I hope that everyone here enjoyed that uh, the fraction as much as I did. I would observe that uh, we, we consumed really more than our allotted hour, and I can't believe this. He's going to get out of here without, without answering a single food question. <laughs> so we'll have to have him back sometime and deal with that. But for now, will you thank Frank Bruni for a great hour? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.